joining us now on the Megacast to talk a little bit more. Congressman Andy Levin with the 9th Congressional District. Always great to have you. Thank you for being with us. Hey, Ronnie. It's so good to see you. I There are so many things that we need to talk about, but if we can just go ahead. Uh, do you want to start on the eve of the inauguration and the security and the events going on in D.C. right now? Yes. Well, I had an experience of it this morning, Ronnie. Um, you know, the, the Biden inauguration decided that anybody attending the inauguration must get a specific COVID test that they chose. And I thought this was a much bigger symbol than just a COVID test. This is a new person coming into, char into power and saying, you know what, I'm going to set public health standards based on science. I'm going to, and I'm going to make it universal for everyone to do one thing and I'm going to enforce it. And like, wow. So I had to come back earlier than expected to DC, but I was very happy to do it because then they know that everybody is safe and, you know, we're kind of looking out for each other. And that's hopefully what the new period will be like now in terms of security, Wow, you know, it is intense, Ronnie. I mean, you. I walked over to the Capitol complex. There's a eight foot fence with concertina wire surrounding the entire, you know, acres and acres of all the buildings, not just the Capitol building, but all the buildings. And I went in and there are thousands of National Guard troops all around the perimeter, all inside, even walking around outside. And after I took my test, I got a chance to, you know, talk to some of them and the gate I left out of, I said, well, where are you all from? And they said, Delaware, which of course is where the president elect is from. And I said, wow, this must be kind of a proud moment for you Delawareans or whatever you call yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and they, you know, they said it is, and it was genuine, you know, this is America, Ronnie, this is our peaceful transfer of power. And it's, on the, it's such a mix of emotions because it's so sad that it has to be so militarized. But on the other hand, here are all these young people saying, you know what, no matter what, we are going to secure this process and we are going to have our peaceful transfer of power, even if it's been highly imperfect in the run up to it. Yeah, but when we're, we're talking about security, um, you're going to be there tomorrow, correct? Yes, ma'am. With that, a couple of questions. So there, there are concerns that some members of the Guard or even some members of the law enforcement community could be a threat to the security for the inauguration tomorrow. How worried are you right now? Well, I have been worried and we raised a lot of alarms since uh, January 6th. We asked a lot of specific questions about vetting of security personnel, about vetting of the guests of my colleagues. I mean, Ronnie, some of my Republican colleagues say, uh, say that the election was stolen and they believe in QAnon crazy conspiracy theories. And they say they want to take their guns around everywhere, you know, so uh, and there are investigations going on about whether uh, some of them collaborated with the insurrectionists. So we had a lot of questions, but I feel quite confident that all the, the Secret Service and the US Capitol Police and the Metropolitan, the police of Washington, DC, the Metropolitan Police and the, the National Guard and all of these forces have come together and are working together to secure the situation. And, um, you know, I hope it's gonna be um, very, you know, very, very safe tomorrow. You know, one thing I was surprised when we all watched the events unfold January 6th, you were there, you were in the middle of it, but do prior to January 6th, did elected leaders uh, practice any type of drills for any type of situations or security breaches prior to January 6th? Well, yes, we did. Yes and no. I mean, in a way. We, all of our offices have these kind of gas masks in them. Um, we have designated um, security coordinators in every member's office. 
Uh, our staff is trained. Uh, we are trained. We have an alert system. I get uh, texts and emails on a regular basis that this or that building within the Capitol complex has been evacuated, what to do. So it's not uncommon. That said, the level of failure of security on January 6th is mind boggling. I mean, we had every reason to know that armed uh, people with, with intent to disrupt the process of our democracy were headed our way. And as you know, some heads have already rolled. I mean, the you know the sergeant of arms of, of, of both the House and the Senate are gone, the Capitol Police chief's gone. But we need to look at this top to bottom and I think, Ronnie, we need to change the way the Capitol Police are overseen. I didn't know anything about this before. I'm just going to tell you that, no, it's not Nancy Pelosi and Mitch McConnell who, you know, are the boss of it. There's this board, a police oversight board, which seems very bureaucratic and cumbersome. And we're going to have to look at the, the oversight of the Capitol Police, the management of the Capitol Police, the whole sergeant at arms structure in the House and the Senate, and make sure nothing like this can ever happen again. Because as horrifying as it was, it could have been a lot worse because people were coming with the intent of kidnapping and killing members of Congress, even the Vice President of the United States. It's still unbelievable uh, that this even unfolded. Uh, Representative Andy Levin with us here on the Megacast. Uh, but again, you know, I think about, you know, all the way back to elementary school, we've done tornado drills. And following 9-11, there were, you know, security drills and mass shootings in schools. So we've done all of these safety drills. It seems like none of that, there were no no procedures such as those put in place for members um, on Capitol Hill at all. Well, I don't really, uh, with all due respect, may, may I disagree with you a little bit? Mm -hmm. Because, so let's think of a tornado drill, right? A tornado drill is, if a tornado happens, what do we do? And how do we, you know, we go under our desk or we go to the, the basement or whatever of the school, or the, I remember, you know, the gym, whatever it was. <laughs> depending on which school you're in. So um, we actually, that kind of thing happened and it worked, right? So I was in my office in the Cannon building. A Capitol Police came and knocked on our door. And only my chief of staff and I were there because I don't have people working in large numbers in the office during COVID, right? And the, and the police said, let's go right now. We're evacuating this building. And they evacuated every office in Cannon very quickly. And we all went over to Longworth, a different office building. And we stayed there. And they evacuated people out of the, out of the chamber of the house and the gallery. So the reason, the little disagreement I'm saying is the issue isn't the tornado warning. I mean, the drill, it's the tornado. <laughs> It's the weather forecast. It's the preparation for the tornado. It's like, or like in a hurricane, why didn't they evacuate the city before the hurricane came in? They knew a hurricane was coming. So the failure was in the intelligence, the preparation for preventing the little drills that we do when a shooter happens, when an emergency happens. They, we, we did evacuate, we did move around. Of course, there was a huge failure of most of my Republican colleagues to follow public health. You know, in the one place where a large number of people had to all shelter in place together, the Ways and Means hearing room uh, in the Longworth building, people refused to wear masks and we had a super spreader event right in the house. And, and like 10 people have gotten COVID from that. So that's, but that's a different matter. So anyway, yeah, we, I think it's the tornado warning. It's the fortification of the city for the tornado because the little emergency procedures we do in the event of an emergency sort of happened and and saved lives really so we're in the final hours of the trump presidency mm. your thoughts going into the biden time period well you know ronnie i was not someone who you know originally supported joe biden it'd be easy for me not to say something like that right because i've 
I'm so supporting him now. But uh, the reason I say that, for one thing, we all have to constantly be humble and you know, realize that we did different things, right? But so I have been so amazed how Joe Biden has turned out to be the perfect person for this moment. He um, is the exact antidote to Donald Trump. He's devoted his whole life to public service at a moment that calls for empathy and making policy in a way to lift people up and support them. Here's a guy who suffered so much in his personal life, losses that thankfully most of us can't even imagine, losing your wife and young child, losing your son to cancer, you know, all these personal tragedies he's had. And I think he is somebody who really relates to people, feels their pain, and is going to lead us out of this pandemic and out of this economic disaster that's accompanied it. And uh, so I'm very, very hopeful about the Biden era, and I support the president-elect and the vice president-elect 100%, and I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that they succeed in you know, this most difficult time really of any new presidency in, I, I'd say since uh, FDR anyway. So, you know, we've been able to talk with numerous uh, elected leaders and I've talked to them, some of them at great lengths behind the scenes as well. And we know a lot of people have been jumping out of politics because they felt like things were so divisive right now in mm -hmm. DC, it was hard to get any work done. Is that going to come to an end? Are the two sides going to be able to disagree but come to some type of compromise on some of these important issues uh, facing our nation? Well, I, I, I wanna emphasize, Ronnie, first of all, that while I really try to be bipartisan and I work with Republican colleagues like on virtually every bill, if you honestly look at American history and who the greatest presidents are considered to be and where we made huge strides, it wasn't about partisanship or bipartisanship. FDR had you know, complete control of the House and the Senate and he made many of the laws that we consider the basic building blocks of American democracy and of our economy. You know, and the same thing with LBJ's work. And the same, uh, you know, the same thing with uh, President Lincoln, really. So I don't, the, you, you cannot get to healing without truth. And you can't get to unity without healing. So I'm not for like superficial notions of let's all sing Kumbaya and come together. Like Ronnie, just imagine we were attacked. People tried to kill us. We went back into the chamber of the house amidst broken glass and freshly washed up blood of someone who'd been killed while she tried to break into the Capitol. And a hundred plus of my Republican colleagues still voted to nullify the votes of millions of Americans in Arizona and Pennsylvania and they wanted to nullify votes in Georgia, Michigan, Nevada too. They couldn't even get one senator to go along, you know, to propose that. Even though 60 court cases had occurred and they hadn't succeeded even getting past first base in one out of 60 court cases. There's no evidence that there was a problem with this election. It's a the big lie. And so I don't, I think we need to um, you know, the, the Republican Party within itself is going to have to decide whether it's going to be a, a party based on facts and truth or conspiracy theories. And I'm, I reach my hand out. I want to work with my Republican colleagues. We're, we can't have a healthy democracy unless we have two or more parties, you know, that take different positions on issues. So it's really important. But I think right now, this, you know, we have to support President, President Biden as he'll be tomorrow in saving the country from the pandemic, rebuilding the economy and all that, and do it as bipartisan as we can. But at the same time, we have to hold uh, Donald Trump accountable for fomenting an insurrection in our capital 
And there are investigations ongoing about whether any of my colleagues assisted with that. And if they did, they need to be held accountable too. And there's no getting to reconciliation without, you know, truth. So. And so with that, because we do know that the House has voted to impeach Donald Trump for a second time, yes. history was made, but yet now it goes to the Senate. He's going to be out of office in just a matter of hours. Right. Why do the Senate trial? Um, well, because there's a, there are a couple reasons. Um, one is that uh, the way impeachment is set up it's to deal with high crimes and misdemeanors. You need to be held accountable just as much if you do something that rises to that standard in the last hour in your office as you do in the first hour. I mean, there's just, you know, accountability. And if you're a parent, you know, <laughs> you need, you know, without limits, you're not going to be successful as a parent. But the second reason is that one of the consequences of impeachment is that we can vote to bar someone from holding office in the future. And I think that Donald J. Trump certainly should be barred from holding office, and that's about the future. And so that's appropriate. Also, if you look at the history of impeachments, not just of presidents, but of other like judges and other federal officers, people have been impeached after or tried after they left office. So I, I think it's a, it's historically appropriate and it's just necessary, um, you know, to to uh, hold him personally accountable and for the health of our democracy. I mean, you know, two weeks ago tomorrow, we came within a few inches of losing the core ideas of our democracy, that the Congress would ratify the votes of the Electoral College and have a peaceful transfer of power as George Washington initiated in the very earliest days. If everybody's, you know, seen Hamilton, you know, I mean, Ale he calls to Alexander Hamilton in and he says, you got to write a speech, I'm on the way out. And, and Alexander Hamilton's like, no, we can't live without you. And he's like, dude, we're not for kings, remember? We're not for that. What we're about is like you serve your country and then you pass it on, even if it's to somebody that disagrees with you. Ronnie, that is the most fundamental thing in our democracy. And we almost lost it two weeks ago. And that was a world historical event. You and I are sitting here talking, but we just lived through not just an event in American history, but because of the role America plays in the world, a world historical event about the life of democracy amongst the people of the world. We have an obligation to America and to democracy around the world to say, nope, we realize that was far out of bounds. We're gonna protect the sanctity of people's votes and of a peaceful transfer of power and make clear that this can never happen again. It is sobering when you think that democracy was attacked January 6th. With that, before we let you go, I know that you're extremely busy. Anything that, there are so many things I want to ask you, but I want to be respectful of your time as well. Anything that you want to uh, share with the public and the viewers before we let you go? Well, you know, Ronnie, I do think it's appropriate to end by pivoting to uh, optimism. How about some of that? Uh, uh, we like that. We like that. <laughs> I am so excited about the 117th Congress and about this new period. I have a whole raft of legislation uh, that I want to pass. Um, I, I'm in, reintroducing my Safe Workers Act with my Republican colleague, Brian Fitzpatrick, so that workers can have elections on whether they want to form a union or not electronically instead of unsafely in person during the pandemic. And if anything from something like small and practical like that to my Electric Vehicle Freedom Act to put high speed chargers throughout the whole national highway system and create many thousands of good union electrician jobs and utility worker jobs so that we can everybody can feel like, yeah, I could buy an EV and go visit grandma in Omaha, Nebraska and be able to get there and back. That helps our auto industry. It creates jobs in and of itself. So this period, I think, is going to be, uh, I hope and pray, a really fertile period 
for reviving our economy, you know, dealing with this pandemic, getting all those vaccines out there, helping everybody get vaccinated much more quickly, and then rebuilding our economy in a way that's really inclusive and green and does our kids proud and, you know, really sets us on a new course. And I think we'll be able to achieve more unity when working people in this country see the American dream come into focus for them again. And they don't, I mean, when you have a majority of Americans living paycheck to paycheck and young people don't even feel they can afford to get married or people don't, can't afford to go to college or they have so much debt afterwards, you know, we've got to fix the basic economic problems so that people have health care, people have a good job, they make enough and they're not freaking out every week about whether they can pay their bills. And, you know, so imagine a president elect who says, we're going to pass $15 an hour right away so that it doesn't mean we'll get to $15 an hour instantly, but we'll set a rising minimum wage and get to $15 an hour in several years. We got to lift up the working people of this country if we want to have a healthier democracy. And I'm, I'm excited because I think we're going to do it. So. Well, with that, we'll go ahead and let you get to work. And we okay. so appreciate your time. And again, uh, we're so happy that you're okay and members of your staff as well. It was a traumatic event, what you witnessed and what happened there in DC on January 6th. And let's hope that things go smoothly over the next uh, few weeks as well. Thanks, Ronnie. Take care of yourself. I'll talk to you soon.